All right, moving right along, we'll go into our next session, which is being led by Matt Garish. Uh, Matt Garish is the chief editor of the EPUB3 suite of specifications and has authored a number of works on EPUB3 and accessibility, including the books, What is EPUB3, Accessible EPUB3, and EPUB3 Best Practices. He currently works on EPUB and accessibility initiatives for the IDPF, DAISY Consortium, and others. Today's talk is about EPUB accessibility and conformance standards. Please join me in welcoming Matt Garish. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I feel like uh, Eliza just covered half my topic. <laughs> Follow everything she says and, and you'll, you'll be well on your way to being accessible. Um, but actually, I, you know, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of a sort of a new area for me. Um, you know, often I come out and, and kind of, you know, put on the pom-poms and, and cheerlead some of the accessibility features and, and tell everybody what's available now and what they can do. And, and while well, that's all good, we're, we're a couple of years on now into, you know, the EPUB's lifetime. So I, I, th I think it's time to get down to a little more practical, but I don't want to also bring out the, you know, the accessibility hammer and start kind of hitting in, you know, best practices that, that you need to follow and can follow. Because, well, that's all good and, and, you know, this kind of environment, it's, it's you know, I, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll take home a bunch of practices, but at the same time, it, it helps to kind of stand back and understand why you know, we're, we're kind of constantly harping on these practices and telling you this is what you need to do and this is how your content needs to be structured. Because if you don't understand that part, if you don't understand why you're doing any accessibility practices, then ultimately, you know, your, things are going to fall through. You're not going to know what to look for. So you need the, the sort of the bigger picture view of, of ebook accessibility if you want to then start to put into place, you know, why does structure matter or why do lists matter versus putting in, you know, P's with bullets and, and things like that. And, and you know, it, it's easy, you know, in accessibility to kind of feel lost when you first get started. It certainly was that way for me. I, you know, I go back at, you know, I don't even know how long now, 14, 15 years, you know, uh, to SGML and then to HTML. And, and I, I wasn't hired. I, I started at the CNIB back in 2007. And I was hired for, you know, for structuring data, for preparing their Braille uh, print documents from a single source. And I, I wasn't hired because I knew accessibility, and I didn't. I've, I've committed every cardinal sin of accessibility that there is to commit. Uh, you know, because at, at the time, it's, it's a combination of, you know, the tools that you use aren't always producing the highest quality content. And, you know, or institutionally, the organizations aren't really pushing you to be accessible. And so things fall through. You think, oh, yeah, well, you know, you sort of hear about an alt tag and, you know, maybe write a long description in the long desk tag if, if you really want to be uh, abusive of HTML. And, and you kind of just think, well, you know, assistive technologies will take care of everything for me somehow. And, and that's not the case. It's, you know, you've got to start structuring your data. You've got to make, you've got to give that, you know, that form and that, that, that sort of standardization that can be used by an assistive technology. Otherwise, there's nothing it can do with your content, you know, to, to sort of pick up on Liza's themes of ugly things you see. And I, I mean, one of the books we saw, it was a one P tag and every paragraph inside was formatted by BR tags. Right. And what are you going to do with that? What's, what's somebody who's trying to use an assistive technology going to get out of that? They're going to go into a chapter and it's, you know, listen to it from beginning to end and, and not try to move anywhere through the, you know, the paragraphs. It's, it's a horrible experience. And so, you know, this is, this is why I'm saying it, it takes time and, and, and it takes some effort because also the other side of the equation is there's so much information in a lot of ways, which is a great thing now that didn't exist before. But, you know, you know like every college in the U.S., their, their disability services departments will have information up on the web for you. And so you can get lost. You can go out and start, you know, how do I become accessible and just get bombarded with sites telling you all kinds of information. So wh what I want to do today is, is look at a, just a few of the really high-level points that I think are sort of key to understanding why, um, you know, why, why we're doing what we're doing, why we're pushing these, these practices that we're pushing. And the, the first one, you know, is kind of, I'm not going to say it's the biggest one. I don't want to rank these things or give an impression that any of these are more or less important. They're all equally important. But the logical reading order, uh, also kind of less jargony um, referred to as sort of your primary narrative, is one of the big keys to accessibility. As I was saying, if, if everything is inside a one P tag, you don't have a logical reading order in a sense. All you have is one big long string of text. And, and trying to expose this, this reading order and bring it out from the markup and from the mess of you know, divs and spans and, and meaningless tags that kind of get you know, strewn about inside of, of eBooks uh, is, is really one of the keys. Because there's, if you can't navigate your book, then you know, what, what use is it to a, to a reader? It's, it's, you know, 
it's not going to get them very far. So one of the things I was wanting to impress too is, is accessible, you know, assistive technologies. You know, it, it, when you're when you're listening, say I, I, I'm going to sort of generalize here too, because accessibility means you know different things to different people. Whether you're blind, whether you're low vision, whether you're dyslexic, uh, it all you know your reading experience will differ, and your preferences and needs will differ. But from a very basic level, when we start with you know blind reading, which is one of the the more complicated um, you know formats to create content for, to make it structured and, and presentable to, um, you know the, the best sort of analogy I can give to you is is it's like an invisible ink experience, where the assistive technology, you can't look ahead. It's not like when you're visually reading. You can look over to another page, or you can see something's coming, and you can stop at certain points, and you can jump over, read a sidebar, see if it's important, go back to where you were reading, uh, pick up again. The, the AT is going to be, if it's, you know, if you're in text-to-speech playback mode, is reading a word at a time. And so, you know, there's, there's, if you don't have any structure of the saying, there's, there's no place to go. And the more structure that you start to build into it, then you start to bring out you know, the form, so somebody can move by paragraphs, somebody can move by list. There's not, you know, you're still always going to have that narrow band where they're not able to look ahead and, you know, in some senses you can't look behind, you can only remember what you've heard. But, you know, this is, this is one of the big keys is, you know, how do we start to structure this? And this is, this is one of the, you know, the, the big topics when I'm talking about the new features in EPUB 3. Really, a lot of the new pub features in EPUB 3 are derived from the new features that are in HTML5 since, you know, obviously XHTML5 is underpinning EPUB3. So now instead of just having headings and, you know, a whole bunch of divs to try to, you know, sort of differentiate things, give the idea that you're, you're, you're giving structure to your content when really using divs isn't giving much in the way of structure to them. We, we've now got a whole new suite of tags that are available. So we've got, you know, not just the section tag, not just being able to group content, but you've got headers, we've got footers, we've got nav elements. Uh, those are able to, you know, differentiate the, the components at the top and the bottom of the page to allow the person to, to get through to where the, the narrative begins. You've got the ability to start breaking out the sidebars and, and figures. So what we're trying to do is, is not have the person interrupted constantly, right? What, what kind of reading experience is it if you, every after every paragraph, you have a bunch of, you know, footnotes? that somebody's put into their markup because that's the right place potentially to put them, uh, you know, from a markup standpoint. But it doesn't make any sense when you're reading. You don't want to be stopped. You, you try to read a textbook. This is one of the big things in education is, you know, when, when students get these materials, it's, it's very, very hard to keep a train of thought going through a book if all, you're constantly hitting these things. And then, you know, add on to that the sidebar perspective, where the sidebar is going to have a heading and it's going to start right in between two paragraphs. So you, suddenly you've gone from one paragraph into a new heading, into a sidebar. Now how do you find your way back to where you were reading? Where's the next paragraph? You've got to start going through one at a time and try to figure out which paragraph is actually the next one in, in the sequence. And so these are, these are the new features that are available to, to start you know, exposing and bringing out the structure of the document. Um, you know, I, I know Liza kind of mentioned that you know, not everything is implemented at this point in time, but don't look at the, the aspects of what is and isn't implemented when you're you're structuring your content. Structure your content always for what you expect it to be used as. Uh, the structure is, I mean, when I look at the DAISY readers, the DAISY format, this is important, right? These are features that are being used and, and implemented, not in HTML5 in, in their own DT book format, but they're what we're expecting as the community moves over to EPUB 3 more and more, that reading systems will also evolve and begin to use these in more meaningful ways. Um, this is just kind of a, a you know a, a quick example. It's it's intentionally blurred, not because of my bad photoshopping skills, but just to kind of give that perspective that when we look at a, a book, right, visually we we can pick out the primary narrative. It's the part that's in white. It's the part that's not have some visual styling applied to it. And this is just kind of that key. Like it, when your CSS is being applied, that's great. It's it works and it's important for visual readers. It's not something we're saying throw out. But at the same time, imagine taking it away. And you still need to be able to use the tags to pick out and point, pinpoint where these, these components are so that ultimately, right, the, the, the ideal end goal is the, the reader has that single experience. They can go in and they can say, I don't want sidebars played back. I don't want figures played back when I'm, I'm listening to the text. Just give me the primary narrative. And then, right, of course, you can, you know, hopefully if you put your list of figures in, they can go to the, the table of contents and go back and quickly get back to those points again later. The other big um, key, I think, for this is, is navigation. 
I've, I've kind of been talking about that, the ability to move and get through the book. I think it's sometimes lost. We, we think navigation and we think the table of contents is the primary way that people navigate and that's not the, entirely the case. It is, of course, an important way for somebody to be able to structurally move through the document, get that big picture, get the whole picture at once because you know EPUBs obviously are, are broken up into pieces. So to just be able to move through the headings is, is you know, fantastic. That's why we're saying, you know, don't strip it down, don't put minimized table of contents in, you know, keep it as full and as rich as you can. Um, but then uh, there's other levels of navigation that are sometimes forgotten, and headings is one of them. Being able to move within the body from you know, primary headings down to secondary headings. Assistive technologies can sometimes tell you, you know, how many lower level headings are there, allow you to navigate to them and get to these points without having to always go back to the table of contents. Because again, you know, if every single time you have to pull up the table of contents, find your way back to where you were, find the next subsection, click on it, go to it, find out it's not where you want, go back to the table of contents. These are the sorts of nuisances that, you know, that really kind of you know, impede somebody's ability to, to absorb and understand. Um, Tables, again, tables, you know, think of a sea of data points. If you're not putting your table headers in, you're not identifying the, for the columns and rows what, what that data point is, it's just, it becomes numbers after a while. Try, try reading a table and blocking off, you know, the header row and try to remember what it is, which data point you're looking at. When you put in the table headers, again, the assistive technologies are able to actually announce those headers to the reader at that point if they want to, you know, more information about it. And finally, lists. Uh, these ones are often overlooked, but when you have a list, you have the ability to jump, you know, not just one by one, but you could jump five or 10 or 50. You get a whole, you know, you get announced how many items are in this list, you know, allows you to move faster through them. I've seen indexes where every index entry is a P tag and then formatted visually to have them indented so you can't even tell which entries are sub entries to any others. I mean, when, when you throw these obstacles at people, to, to try to understand the book. You think of it visually and, oh, well, I don't have a problem with it because it's all nice and clear. But if it's not clear in the markup and it's only clear through visual presentation, right, this is, this is, this is a big, big problem for people. It's, it's, this is what causes you know, all of these, these problems in, in you know, just being able to consume content. So that's kind of the, the, high, the high level. Um, I, I think the ultimate goal is to, like I say, to have comparable access to information. This is where everything else, you know, all of the other good practices fall in, whether it's, you know, making sure your images are fully described, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, progressive enhancement. I'm losing my, uh, my train of thought. Um, being able to enhance on top of scripting. So even though you're using scripting, right, we're not trying to say don't create, you know, fancy, beautiful, wonderful, interactive content. Nobody's ever said that, you know, in accessibility circles. It's never, we're never sitting there and telling publishers, no, don't do this. It's always, okay, you're doing this, so what can we do to catch up and try to give this comparable access to information? Because that's, that's ultimately the goal. Why should somebody not be able to have access to the same amount of information in the book as somebody who's cited? simply because you know, you're not using structured markup or you're not put, using best practices. You know, it's, it's, it's a very, I don't want to call it deliberate because as I said, there's, there's lots of reasons why inaccessible content gets produced. But knowing these things and knowing the, the limitations you're putting on people, you know, this is what we're, we're trying to enforce. This is why we keep hammering at all of these, these practices over and over again and saying, you know, pay attention, do what you can, you know, start making you know, even small changes to make a difference in your content. And that always kind of leads to the other question is where do these all come from, right? Who's, who's making up all of these rules and why should we follow them? And is it just you who's saying this, right? And, and it's not, I, I mean, sometimes obviously, you know, different formats, you're gonna have to do, you know, you're gonna work within the, you know, the constraints of what they offer. But for HTML, which is underpinning EPUB, right? We've got the web content accessibility guidelines, which is, you know, a W3C working group who, who's developed and maintained these things, which is basically the big compendium of, of best practices that have you know, evolved since the beginning of the web. So you, you know, there's this whole base and a whole knowledge base out there of people who understand and, and are familiar with WCAG. Um, you know, it, it's, that's, that's what makes EPUB so fantastic is you know, so many formats you know, don't have this range. They've kind of evolved away, but you know, everything is there for you at this point in time. You've got ARIA you know, attributes, which I'll get to later. Uh, you know, you've, you've got all of the, the structural uh, elements at this point in time. And, and sort of the, the key again too for, for WCAG, I've got them up here now, is the, you know, there's four primary principles. Again, perceivable, operable, understandable, 
and robust is is you know making sure your data is valid that it, it's you know you're not presenting invalid XML that's going to you know potentially crash in AT or, or mess things up. It's it's you know all of these together this this big holistic picture is ultimately what we're trying to get to. And of course, WCAG then sort of grows and grows. You you go from guidelines or principles to guidelines to um, to success criteria, and then ultimately there's sufficient technique. So it, it kind of branches out and gets bigger and bigger. And that's where sometimes you know you, you can get lost as well as which ones of these apply. How do I apply them to eBooks? What am I supposed to do? Um, again, this leads to some proliferation, as I'm saying, of, of you know these various websites that are promoting and 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 uh, you know kind of elaborating on on how to apply this uh, these principles to your your web content. And of course, the IDPF. Uh, after doing the, the O'Reilly book on accessibility, we wanted to kind of put similar information, get it consumable for people, quickly, easily, searchable, findable, out on the web, um, you know, quick uh, sort of how-tos. And I'm just going to show this briefly. This is the, the, the main page for the website. Um, if it looks kind of rudimentary and like a table of contents, that's because the website is also uh, duals as a EPUB 3 that we package up. It's, it's downloadable at the bottom. Um, Again, I'll, I'll just kind of pick out lists here for fun. Um, it's all kind of the same thing. This is where, like, if you want, I, I'm throwing out the big picture. Um, if you want to start to get the details, I, I'd highly recommend this site to you. What it does, it starts off, it, it tries to give some more of this context, some more of the background to why these matter, uh, why these features are important, not just to, again, throw at you the, you know, you must do this, but to try to fill in some of these blanks so that you have that sense of, of what you're trying to accomplish ultimately, because not everything's going to fit, right? It not, you're going to run into situations where you're looking at content going like, you know, how on earth am I going to even represent this accessibly? And, and it's going to take some thought. So um, again, also too, there's the, the compliance uh, standards. We point to the WCAG uh, success techniques as well so that you can verify and check and see whether or not uh, your content is, you know, is, 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 is valid to, to what they're saying. Um, frequently asked questions and things. Um, the other one that I wanted to show here too is that we also are providing a checklist. So we've got this full checklist here, which is kind of huge. Um, I, I think somebody says 130 points in it. So again, it, it kind of seems overwhelming, but it, not all of them apply, right? It, just because there are um, accessible uh, techniques, it doesn't mean that you have to worry about every single one of them in your content. It, it depends on what you're doing. So the other idea that we had is to start to you know, create a, a dynamic uh, generator, something that you can go in and just pick out what it is that you've actually used in your book. So it, you can go in, I mean, this is just a, a default reflowable XHTML, you know, table of contents, you know, pick a couple of things, images, um, and links, and we'll go down. And we'll just get a smaller tailored list that, that goes through what are the keys in that case. But of course, at this point, right, uh, that's, that's as far as I'm going to go just on the basic structural part of it. Uh, you know, you start to think, okay, well, I've got my file. I can load it into a browser now, and I've got an initial state, right? I've got my punch card that I'm going to feed in, and whether an AT is, you know, going to interact with it or not, it's, it's up to the browser engine to take this content in. But, but things will change, right? If, if you're using scripting, if you're using forms, Right? The, the initial state that it starts in is not what's going to you know, persist as the user interacts with their book. And that's where the other big standard, which is Way, Way Aria, um, which is Accessible Rich Internet Applications, comes in. Uh, this standard, um, it, it's about when you sort of move off and start crafting your own dynamic scripted components. So if, if you're using HTML5 or, or you know, basic form elements, these already map to the accessibility APIs because when you think about it, there's, there's the assistive technology and there's the reading system. And these things have to talk to each other, right? It's not an integrated, um, you know, you've got your voiceover and you've got your, your, your iBooks reader. They're still two separate applications, right? They still need to talk to each other. They're still going to get information from each other. So the assistive technology actually will take the DOM, take your document object model that's been built into the browser engine. It's going to create an accessibility tree internally for the person to be able to move through it. 
but you still, then what happens with the dynamic parts, right? When you have the accessibility API and you have the mappings for the elements, everything's great, right? They talk to each other, it's all good. But then you go off and you say, well, I'm gonna start putting divs and I'm gonna call this a, a button and I'm gonna make this a checkbox, it's just a span, right? And suddenly you've lost all of those nice mappings, right? Now, how does somebody who's using assistive technology know that this is supposed to be dynamic? You put an on-click event on it and that's great, so somebody who's you know, visually able to use a mouse can click and, and, and interact with this, but everybody else is kind of left in this, this vacuum where there's nothing there. So that's, that's what Yari is addressing. You know, how do we start to make these components equally accessible so that they at least appear like standard web forms? Um, the roles will set things like, you know, is this a button? Is this a checkbox, right? And then you start to have states and properties. You know, is it checked? Is it unchecked? Is it disabled? Is it not disabled? So when you're building your code, you're actually able to set all of these ARIA properties and states so that the two, again, can talk to each other so that somebody who's using the assistive technology, again, has full access. So even though you've gone and done something, like I said, something wildly you know, unique and, and you know, off on your own, that's, that's not a bad thing in and of itself. What is bad is when you don't go and then make it accessible and you forget about all of the ARIA components. Because what good is, you know, I was just at the EduPub conference and we were looking at widgets and one of the widgets that came up, nothing. It was all divs and spans. And how good is this for education, right? How are you gonna set this out to, uh, you know, a larger community of students who need to be able to, you know, do their tests, interact with the content when, when there's nothing, right? It's, it's just a blank, it's just a, you know, a, an empty slate to them. And one thing I, I was just gonna point out here too, ARIA 1.1 um, is in the works. ARIA 1.0 is, is almost finally a recommendation after years and years and years. 1.1 uh, introduces a new attribute called described at. Uh, there's kind of a big outcry when long desk was dropped from HTML5. Uh, there's no longer a way to make reference for to uh, out of band. Uh, description. So basically you, you have two elements or two attributes now. ARIA described by says, okay, there's some description on the page, you know, here's where it is, you can point to it. What was missing was the ability to say, there's a description, but I'm, I'm housing it externally somewhere, whether that's another file, whether that's a description repository somewhere, there was no way to point outside of the page to get to it, except through some really like hacky things using invisible iframes and, and stuff like that. But it is, it's, it's coming, it's sort of the, a, a bigger replacement even than long desk, you can use it on any element, so you can describe tables, you can describe, you know, not just, like I say, the figures, anything at all, anything that's complex that a user might want more information about, you can then use this attribute. The only thing is, it's EPUB 3.01, which is not yet a recommendation, probably in the next week or two? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm not 100% sure what the, the final timeline, I know it just went to the board and, and we're looking to, uh, to keep moving it along. So it's, it's something to keep in the back of your head if, if you've bumped into this problem, how do I set descriptions? There is this attribute on its way. And of course discovery, you know, I, I'm gonna pick up on Liza's point again and, and kind of hammer at everybody that, you know, discovery is so important, especially for accessibility. What's, you know, you, you don't wanna do all of this work, you don't wanna to go in and spend all of your time you know, making this content as rich and as accessible as you can, and then it's just lost in a sea of, of inaccessible content and nobody can ever find it. And so there's, there's, there's actually two sets now of, um, of accessibility metadata that are usable. One is in the Onyx uh, code list 196, which has been around since 3.0 was launched. Um, again, this can travel with your EPUB into the distribution systems. It provides information on various uh, accessible features such as structured markup, you know, have you provided all text and descriptions? Uh, I'm not aware, uh, I, I know the Italians are using this for discovery in bookstores at this point in time. I don't know outside of them if anybody is at this point. Um, the other brand new one that uh, we just actually got through in, uh, in December is uh, schema.org metadata for accessibility. That's another project that I've been working on. Uh, and it's not just for the web. Uh, this metadata can also be used in the EPUB package document. Again, this is something we're looking at for the educational metadata so that uh, you can build a picture of the EPUB, let everybody know what is available, what features are in it, whether, so they can make that informed decision again, whether the content will meet their needs or not. And this is, this is kind of my ending quote for the day. I, I always love this one. <laughs> it's uh, in theory, theory and practice are the same, in practice they are not. Uh, 
Accessibility is no difference, right? You, you can talk all the theory in the world, but as I said, when you get out into that, that, that mucky, dirty EPUB world of, of auto-generated content, and, and even not even necessarily it's, it's stuff that's bad, but just when you're, you're, you're pushing the boundaries, and you're gonna find that accessibility is as much an art as a science. Uh, you're gonna have to make decisions that you know, there may not be precedent for. You're gonna run into content that may not be easily made accessible. Infographics, for example. Um, you know, e even uh, like ARIA, you can make you know, scripted content accessible or controllable, but what does it mean to make it accessible when it changes dynamically? How do those cha dynamic changes get relayed onto the user, right? I, uh, one, one example I remember seeing was you know, a sine wave. And you can change the amplitude and the frequency to change what the sine, you know, what the, the sine wave looks like. But how do you tell the person dynamically as that's happening? What's going on, right? It, it can be perfectly controllable, but the accessibility part is still hard. So that's what I'm saying. I, I mean, there are always going to be decisions. I'm just hoping, you know, maybe I've, I've gotten through a little bit of why the big picture, right? If you keep that big picture in mind, that ultimately you want your content to be fully consumable, equally consumable, the information to not be lost to you know specific reader groups, then you know hopefully you can't go wrong. And thank you. I'll leave off on that. <laughs>